the 1619th project. Uh, now, of course, it's been serialized for Hulu. Imagine that, the Hulu version of 1619. I, 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 for people who know me, I really don't speak this way, but it's rooted in lies. Uh, it's not just kind of, uh, you know, a, uh, an accidental miscalculation. This is purposeful erasure uh, of American memory. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Johnny Burtka and Dan McCarthy. Today, we are joined by Timothy Gagline, who is the Vice President of External and Government Relations at Focus on the Family. He was previously Special Assistant to President George W. Bush and Deputy Director of the White House Office of Public Liaison. Tim is also the author of a number of books, including The Man in the Middle, about the Bush administration through the lens of faith and politics, American Restoration, and most recently, Toward a More Perfect Union, about patriotic education, which he joins us to talk about today. He also has a longtime ISI connection, uh, going all the way back to 1976, when he was 12 years old, and had the the privilege to meet uh, with Russell and Annette Kirk uh, through an ISI program. So it's great to have you uh, back at ISI, Tim. Thank you, Johnny and Dan. It's great, truly great to be with you. Well, before we continue with our interview, I'd like to thank you all for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling that mission, be sure to rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Well, Tim, uh, as with all authors that we have on our show, we'd like to start off by giving you an opportunity to tell us why did you why did you feel the need to write this book and uh, what's the key thesis and what do you hope to accomplish with it? Well, thank you, Johnny, for asking. You know, in my role at Focus on the Family, as you mentioned, I'm one of the vice presidents, and I'm based here in Washington. I travel about a third of the time, uh, and uh, almost everywhere uh, that I go, uh, north, south, east, west, whether it's a heavily progressive uh, audience, a a conservative audience, a mix, et cetera, none of the above ideologically, uh, almost always, given uh, the the topics of focus, marriage, family, parenting, uh, human life, religious liberty, the course of the nation, public policy, it's uh, actually predictable that uh, when you get to the kind of questions and answers, dialogue and conversation, uh, almost always uh, it's common for people to come up and to express their very deep uh, concern about the state of the nation and where we're going. Uh, And if they have children or grandchildren, they almost always say something like, I've never been more concerned about uh, the course of the country. Uh, And then uh, thirdly, again, with almost pinpoint uh, predictability, they say, I I don't know what to do. I I don't know how to think about it. And so uh, after uh, hearing this uh, refrain over and over again, I began to do uh, a lot of research uh, on this broad framework of of what do you have uh, in in a country and culture when you have almost a tangible Uh, cultural, historic, uh, constitutional illiteracy. Uh, And I and I began thinking, you know, are are we on the road really to this? And uh, and the more empirical research I did, uh, Johnny and Dan, the more that I found that we're not on the road, that we're there, Uh, that by uh, almost any measurable large uh, survey uh, uh, and and really almost regardless of where you're at uh, in the nation, I think you can uh, say uh, with, uh, with some uh, uncomfortability that we have arrived at a moment in American history where we have truly never been before. Uh, in the rising generation of young Americans, broadly speaking, uh, the idea uh, of what is in the Constitution, about you know, what, what the Constitution is really about, the Declaration of Independence, the Federalist uh, Papers, just, just a general outline about where we're at uh, in our nation and, 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 and where we come from. Uh, almost always uh, the uh, you know anecdotes are not statistics, but almost always it's a, it's a remarkably uh, you know, troubling thing to think about. And even though I'm a conservative, I'm an inveterate optimist. And so I didn't want to just understand where we're at in the first third of the book. 
uh, you know, really uh, paints a picture of where we're at culturally, historically, constitutionally. But I also wanted to provide, you know, important ways as a conservative to think about uh, what, what, what we might do next. And, and I'll just close this kind of early comment, uh, gentlemen, by saying uh, that I begin the book, uh, you know, in my new friendship uh, with the late David McCullough, one of my favorite historians. And in a uh, hallway conversation, the first time we met at the White House, uh, he said to me almost casually, I'm suffering from insomnia. And I thought, you know, gosh, what an interesting uh, way to begin a, a friendship. And he said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm suffering from insomnia. He said, the more political leaders I meet with, the more young people I meet, I realize they don't know the American story. They, they, they don't know the basic chapters. They don't know the basic outlines in the political class. He thought it was very important to understand how history uh, is a prelude, you know, to the moment that you're in. And so it's uh, it's off of that that I begin to build uh, the book toward a more perfect union. And I and I subtitled it the moral and cultural case for teaching the great American story. So so that that that's the template, Johnny. Uh, and that was my motivation. So, Tim, one of the things that comes through powerfully in your book is that this great change that has come to America, this sudden forgetting of all that had been honorable in our history and what we had in common as citizens, has taken place in your own lifetime. And you grew up in an America that still had a fairly strong sense of its identity, a common identity, a sense of pride in its history. But when you got to higher education, you started to find this America was suddenly being deconstructed, uh, demolished, and transformed, changed into a very different kind of narrative. Tell us a little bit about what that experience was like. I appreciate that, Dan. Yes, I'm the last year of the baby boom, born in 1964. Uh, and I was educated in, in really what were considered excellent public schools in the Midwest at the time. And I know uh, for certain uh, that I uh, had teachers, uh, you know, who were uh, left and right. Uh, and yet there was, uh, you know, broad consensus, uh, you know, not uh, more than uh, 20 years after the, uh, you know, close of World War II. Uh, you know, there was broad consensus on what the American story was. There was the pre-founding. There was the Revolutionary War. Uh, you know, the Civil War, uh, the two world wars, the Great Depression, the Cold War, etc. But the moral and the social uh, revolution, and that's what it was, of the 60s and the 70s really upended, uh, you know, that broad agreement on what constituted the American story. Uh, revisionism, uh, erasure, wokeism, cancel culture, all the things that we kind of, you know, summarize in the early 21st century, Dan as we all know, did not begin as seedlings just a couple of years ago. It really began uh, with people like Howard Zinn. Of course, I devote an entire chapter to Howard Zinn. But you're right. When I got to one of the Big Ten uh, universities, uh, I was uh, rather stunned, shocked uh, by some of the things that I was uh, you know, being taught for the first time. And uh, I later went back uh, into my own community where I grew up. Uh, visited the schools there and uh, was genuinely surprised by what I had found. And of course, as a lifelong reader uh, of history, biography, broadly speaking, culture, uh, cultural criticism, etc., you know, I, I write about the incredible wreckage uh, that has happened uh, in our nation. By the way, I mentioned earlier, Dan and Johnny, something that I think is very important in light of your question, Dan which is that I went back and looked at empirical data of broad surveys uh, of what we call the citizenship test, people who want to become legal citizens, uh, you know, the questions that they were asked, the basic questions. And I began looking, uh, you know, just to, in some of this research at 2009, as you know, Dan, uh, from, uh, from reading the book, uh, then I zoomed ahead 10 years and, and so forth to look at this data. And uh, I, I'm looking just at one survey and I cited it in the book, as you know, Dan, because it's so common. Um, this is uh, a very large uh, survey that was given, uh, of all places, in the state of Oklahoma to public uh, school students. I mean, this is really remarkable. Only one in four could name George Washington as the first president of the United States. Less than 30 percent knew that the president of the United States um, is the uh, you know is the is the head of the executive branch of our government and on and on and uh, these kind of statistics go. Uh, I by the way, uh, you all know I'm very kind, rightfully so, to ISI. Uh, I uh, 
dumped, jumped into your uh, own surveys of colleges and universities, even grading, you know, in an era of great inflation on a, on a curve. I was stunned to see that Harvard University barely scored 70 percent, you know, on these basic questions, uh, you know, of American history. And that was the high watermark in the ISI survey. So I, I think that we should be deeply concerned, and I do mean deeply concerned, even as an inveterate optimist, by the arc of what this data is telling us, not just anecdotally, Dan, in the way that you ask about the way that I grew up, uh, but, uh, but the arc that we are on as we head well into the 21st century. Tim, it strikes me, you know, you, you talk about how things shifted in the 60s, how your experience of public education is very different than that of today. Um, I think that's even true for someone like myself, who's 33 years old, thinking back, you know, I went to a public high school in the Midwest. And, you know, it's certainly, if you were to analyze the curriculum, it would not be, you know, a model ISI or Hillsdale, you know, high school curriculum, but it was still a, a relatively... I would say vanilla telling of American history through the lens of, you know, a Houghton Mifflin textbook or, you know, it, there, there was nothing particularly sure they were maybe more sympathetic to the New Deal or the Great Society than conservatives would be. But, you know, it was still a space in which a conservative like myself could very easily, I remember vividly, sort of defending the pro-life position in a debate. And then we took a poll on, you know, and probably maybe a little more than half of the students agreed with me and, and maybe less than half agreed with the other side. It was all still very much, um, you know, quite civil. There, there, the stakes weren't really that high. It, was, it still felt as though we were in a neutral world. And I do think that a lot of that, probably since 2016, has really unraveled so that we're no longer in a neutral world anymore. We're in a new, there's a new orthodoxy that's dominating our schools and it, it continues to get you know, worse and worse with each passing year. I'm wondering, though, if maybe, you know, a lot of, I, I think the starting in the 1960s is a very legitimate place to start in terms of where things went wrong. But I'm wondering if you could go back perhaps a little further and explain, you know, what did civics education look like, for example, during the 19th century? You know, was it really during the progressive era that we began to see a shift or what are some of the historical changes in our approach to civic education pre-1960s? Well, I, I feel very confident that pre-1960s, uh, the era of erasure was well underway. Uh, and in fact, uh, and you know, I, I love this uh, question, Johnny, it could go in, in so many excellent directions, but there's no doubt uh, whatsoever. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, just so handy that Woodrow Wilson you know, happened to be the president of the United States, having come fully out of academia, you know, who wrote books about his uh, remarkable uncomfortability with the American way of life and American government. In, in fact, I think uh, if people don't know, they may to be, uh, you know, surprised to learn uh, that the president, President Wilson, favored really the British uh, form of, uh, of, of government. Uh, and uh, it's not too much to say that he fashioned himself, uh, you know, our British prime minister. Uh, he was uh, quite uncomfortable with we the people, uh, and he was very open about uh, saying so, uh, uncomfortable with the idea of a bicameral legislature. And I could go on from there. Uh, I do think uh, in the contemporary iteration, it is fair to say, and it's the reason I devote a chapter to Howard Zinn, uh, the now deceased neo-Marxist who flew under the banner of, of, of American history, but as I detail at length and toward a more perfect union, uh, Howard Zinn uh, set out to do the thing that I think is very important that every conservative in the country know about, which is he set out purposely to erase the American story. Yeah, he said he was the original cancel culture guy. Uh, in fact, I was giving a book talk a few weeks ago, and one of his former students in Boston uh, told me that uh, after a typical class, after a lecture, uh, you know, Howard Zinn would listen to his students and then after the, uh, the, the conversation part of class, then would proceed to correct every student uh, and, and make sure, you know, that, that, that the, uh, you know, the, the former uh, view of fact-based history was replaced by the Howard Zinn view of history. And the unfortunate thing, uh, gentlemen, is that the Howard Zinn 
uh, goal has been achieved. Uh, you know, where, whereas in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, as Dan asked about, there was this kind of contested ground. Uh, now the Zen version is the predominant uh, version that is taught uh, in American schools, colleges, and universities. Uh, I think the most uh, important example, and there are many, unfortunately, is the one that I write about again with some length, the 1619th Project. Uh, now, of course, it's been serialized for Hulu. Imagine that, the Hulu version of 1619. I, I, uh, for people who know me, I really don't speak this way, but it's rooted in lies. Uh, it's not just kind of uh, you know a, uh, an accidental miscalculation. This is purposeful erasure uh, of American memory. And of course, uh, the author of 1619, the, the primary author, actually was quite pleased uh, by the iconoclasm and violence of the summer of 2020. So uh, this idea uh, of fact-based uh, history uh, that is rooted in this extraordinary American story uh, now is under full assault. Your mention of uh, Howard Zinn brings up the question of what kind of anti-venom or uh, antidote is there to Howard Zinn's version of history? Who are the historians you look to, for example, either uh, historically or in the present, uh, to restore a proper sense of America? You know, uh, Dan, I uh, write about and am eager uh, to, to uh, uh, share with everybody who will listen uh, the 1776 Project. Uh, this is one of the Trump-Pence initiatives that is now virtually forgotten. And it's a real shame because it is the absolute best antidote uh, to 1619. Uh, I know all of us uh, on this conversation really venerated the late Paul Johnson, another great American historian uh, and fellow conservative, uh, who made very clear that the, that the, that the antidote uh, you know, to the kind of thing we're talking about is not an alternative ideology, but just good, honest history, you know, how old fashioned. Uh, but uh, 1619 is now being taught in some version in over 4,500 American schools. You know, that really should shock us and it's deplorable, it's indefensible. Uh, and I think that, that projects like 1776 are the best single, uh, easily accessible uh, curriculums that are out there. Uh, 1776 tells the truth. It says that America was not founded in 1619 when slave ships came to the coastlands of what is now the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, that America was founded in 1776 in Philadelphia um, and the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the 1776 Project, uh, I think, does a beautiful job of connecting the Declaration uh, to the trouble uh, that we have with the Articles of Confederation, with the ratification of the Constitution, uh, the nullification crisis, uh, the problems leading into, and uh, the the uh, cataclysm and the charnel house um, of the uh, of the Civil War, uh, the, the the Reconstruction era. Uh, I could go on and on. I think that 1776 is highly reliable, and uh, I must say, if we were having this conversation in 1993. I think there were less than 40,000 homeschooling uh, families. Now we have multiple millions of them. Uh, I think that we have a, a new era uh, for education at every level that I think is enormously promising. So I think there are all kind of excellent alternatives rooted not in ideology, but rooted in the truth. And I think that the rising generation of young Americans, uh, in my view, are going to have to have access to this, if at least in part, we are to battle back uh, by this kind of malevolent, cancerous, uh, you know, redirection of what the United States of America is actually all about. Not just what its purpose is, uh, but its pre-founding, its founding, and why it matters. Tim, one thing uh, I might add to that, but I think in, in many respects it builds on your case for the need to tell the American story and the need to use history to do it. As I, I really do think that, yeah, we shouldn't underestimate the power of even popular historical biographies, you know, even Ron Chernow's Hamilton, you know, David McCullough's books, because I think they really humanize the founders and they situate the reader in this compelling narrative where, you know, you, you learn to develop a, a sense of charity for these characters, 
you can see their faults, you can see their virtues, and you get a really rich picture. And, um, you know, I think given that our country, that our culture is so television oriented, one TV series after another, you know, I, I don't propose that we, we make our own sort of kitsch version of all these shows, but I do think you can really tell these stories in, in a full way and in a way that would actually engender quite a bit of sympathy for what our founders and what some of the great American heroes were up to. And, and I also think that story, I think back to, um, one of my favorite books, uh, Xenophon's The Education of Cyrus, you know, going all, all the way back to ancient Greece. And, and during the Renaissance, uh, Philip Sidney was writing about that book. And he said that the reason the book is so powerful is because it's not a, a treatise of, you know, political theory. He's telling the story of Xenophon, of, of Cyrus from, from birth until death. And because he's telling a story, uh, Sydney says it has the potency to create many more Cyruses throughout history and then in our, in our own day. So I do think returning to story uh, is key to, to especially capturing the imagination of young people. So, so do I, the moral imagination. That's what ISI is all about, of course. That's right. Uh, may, may, may I tell you, uh, to that very point, if I may, Johnny, uh, you all may know that in the book, I write at some length about uh, Chief Seattle. Uh, I write about Father Sarah. Uh, just in the last uh, few months, I have been in the great Northwest uh, and I've been on campuses. Uh, and I'd like to use two examples, if I may, to highlight the importance of story, erasure, and Johnny, the, the point that you are raising. These are real examples. So I'm in the Northwest uh, and uh, I was in, was in four uh, different classes on a well-known uh, college campus. And I asked, uh, you know, here we are in the Northwest. Uh, I'd like anybody uh, here to tell me anything that they know about Chief Seattle. Now, I think it's fair to say that in the last five years, uh, left or right, the word Seattle has you know, been pretty common in our, in our uh, public discourse. And yet in my research, I kept looking for a single mention of the, uh, of the namesake of the city of Seattle. There, it just doesn't, he doesn't come up, Chief Seattle. And of course, he's one of the most important, substantial American uh, figures in all of American history, certainly uh, in the history of the Great Northwest, and trying to understand, uh, uh, you know, a number of avenues that lead into the hub of the central story of the American West, it would be impossible to make that study without understanding Chief Seattle. And across all of these classes, there wasn't a single, not one student who could share with me anything about Chief Seattle. They had no idea who he was. They had no idea uh, that uh, what he had achieved. Uh, but I, I did hear uh, from two academics who told me that the thing I needed to know was that he was an enslaver. Uh, and it, it's true, he did own slaves. And I asked, having acknowledged that point, if there was anything else that they, uh, that they could share with me. And of course, there, there wasn't. Uh, related to that, um, I'm uh, just back, actually, from a substantial uh, number of speaking engagements uh, in the Mid-Atlantic. And in one particular well-known, extremely large university, I spoke in seven classes, seven. And I asked uh, in, the, in every one of those classes, are there any native Californians or young people who have spent substantial parts of their life in California? A sea of hands. Great. Put your hands down. I said, can anybody here with the California tie, anybody tell me who Father Sarah was. And across uh, seven classes, there was a grand total of one student, one who had heard the name Father Sarah, but was uncertain uh, as to who uh, he was. I mean, the founder of California, the founder of the incredible missions of California. Uh, what, what, a, what a remarkable legacy and achievement. Uh, and, and what I mean by this, Johnny, is that part of the danger uh, to your wonderful uh, a story, that part of the danger to honest narrative, honest stories, is that these remarkable figures have been totally erased. And I mean totally erased. Uh, Father Sarah, Winston Churchill, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, look what has happened to the ancestral homes now of, uh, of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Uh, the authors of the Declaration of Independence, um, the author, principal architect of the Constitution, both of them presidents. Uh, I mean, it's really deeply sobering 
uh, you don't have to go very far to realize, wow, uh, I'm having a conversation with uh, remarkably bright, intelligent people who have no idea about this kind of basic precepts of this extraordinary country. Tim, that's a great point. And you know, there were statues of Father Sarah that were torn down during the uh, 2020 riots. And it goes to show when you destroy the material environment, when you destroy beautiful things, you're also destroying your own memory, your own cultural touchstones. And that can even be, you know, in the case of other monuments, it may be painful memories. It may be memories that, uh, you know, have to be preserved in order that we know to learn from the lessons of the past, as opposed to, uh, you know, in the case of Father Sarah, learning, you know, from a positive example. But uh, this destruction of, you know, both the American mind and the American, uh, you know, built environment, the uh, public space of, of statues and, and buildings, uh, it really is an act of, uh, it's, it's cultural vandalism on a scale that is just absolutely astonishing. Now, this discussion of uh, the importance of storytelling puts me in mind of some of the great films of, for example, uh, Ron Maxwell, who made uh, Gettysburg and Gods and General, Gods and Generals. Uh, and uh, there was a, this wonderful HBO uh, miniseries on John Adams about 20 years ago, which was uh, very well received. And Tim, I know you've done a lot of work uh, in the cultural field, uh, talking to artists and uh, writers about uh, the kinds of cultural works that can help to restore this sense of what America means and of what Western civilization means. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, perhaps, um, you know, sort of signs of hope that you might see in terms of a revival of uh, classical styles or of uh, good storytelling in history or in fiction? Uh, I, I am loaded with with, uh, with with great news in that regard. Uh, I'll start close to home, if I may. Uh, we have lived for many years, you know, uh, very close to uh, to Mount Vernon. Uh, and not many years ago, uh, the uh, Mount Vernon Ladies Association, praise God, that ancestral home of George Washington is in private and not public hands. Uh, but they built the most remarkable library of George Washington, and they, mo they built a really awesome museum there. And I'm very pleased to report, Dan, that their attendance is doing extremely well. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, it's, uh, Mount Vernon is so incredibly accessible and family friendly uh, that, they, that they do an excellent job uh, in the Mid-Atlantic of, of bringing uh, you know, school, uh, children and uh, families, etc. They really encourage that in their marketing and in their uh, promotion. Uh, I think that uh, our uh, Civil War and American Revolutionary War uh, battlefields and sites are doing very well. And in fact, in toward a more perfect union, I say that if if parents and grandparents and families and communities and churches and houses of worship, if they actually want to share the beauty of the American story. It's one thing, of course, to watch a film, which we've been talking about. It's one thing uh, to listen to a podcast. I highly recommend it. But what, one of the things that I think is so important is to actually get members of this gen the young generation, get them to the sites, get them to Gettysburg, get them to Valley Forge, get them to the South Rim uh, you know, of the Grand Canyon. Uh, you know, Theodore Roosevelt. I mean, he was a progressive. I'm a conservative. We didn't hold, hold truck, but a lot of things. Good. You know, it's a big country. Uh, but I mean, what a remarkable American, uh, you know, a, a naturalist, a historian. He said that that every American one time in his or her life should stand on the south rim of the Grand Canyon. I could not agree more. Our national parks, our national historic sites, you know, America is the great beneficiary of this extraordinarily beautiful and awesome uh, country. And in each and every one of the 50 states and in our protectorates, there are great cultural and historic landmarks and places to visit. And so Dan and Johnny, my very strong sense is that it's not gonna be Wall Street or Silicon Valley or Hollywood or Washington, heaven forfend, that are going to you know, help uh, give us a kind of restoration and, and revival of history and culture. Uh, it seems to me that it's going to happen uh, bottom up uh, and localism. It's going to happen uh, first in families and neighborhoods and communities and civic organizations, as I say, uh, religious institutions that are that are realizing the importance of this cultural moment that we are in and how it impacts uh, you know a, a, a bevy of things. So it seems to me that there is a robust uh, you know a civic culture. 
Uh, it's just that it needs, uh, I think, uh, more attention and more spotlight uh, to be uh, to be shown upon it. Tim, you've talked about uh, how the uh, you know the the humanities, the social sciences, civic education today is you know is is suffering under the the new sixteen nineteen curriculums. I'm wondering if you could say a word about the sciences and in STEM. Uh, you may have seen a, a recent piece in the New Yorker called uh, "The End of the English Major," uh, and in it, you know, they make a couple interesting, uh, you know, remarks. One of them is that at Harvard, for example, only seven percent of the the incoming class in 2020 plans to major in the humanities broadly. You know, history, philosophy, uh, English, only seven percent, and uh, they talk a, a lot about something that actually kind of su surprised me the rise of uh, uh, statistics as being sort of the dominant paradigm that students look look at things. And, you know, when a student is reading, for example, Homer's Odyssey, uh, you know, they're not kind of uh, deductively sort of drawing conclusions about, oh, human nature, you know, based on this little his vignette in the story, because, you know, what's the sample size? And where where was this taking place? It's, it's almost laughable how you would try to apply that kind of data to... Uh, you know, an epic poem. Um, so I guess my question is, where exactly, and I think perhaps it was during the Cold War, you know, in the need, the, the legitimate need to compete with the Soviet Union that a lot of the emphasis on STEM came in. Uh, but how do we revive the humanities in the university? And what does it look like to still have a vibrant STEM kind of program, but to have it in its right, rightful place and not to capture the whole of the university? I, I, I may say, Johnny, I feel quite confident that it is not going to happen in most uh, colleges that we have historically said uh, are the elite or the better colleges. I think there are there are exceptions to that. Of course, Columbia University and some others, uh, you know, uh, maintain, uh, you know, basic uh, what we would say are kind of Western stiv. But of course, it's it's not just that they're maintaining it. It's what are they actually reading? Who's actually teaching? Uh, and when you when you jump into that, uh, there's there certainly are troubling signs. No, I, I think we need to 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 look in in, in new venues and new vistas. Uh, first and foremost, I think that we should take heart uh, in the booming nature of uh, of classical learning, uh, both in sectarian and non sectarian schools. Uh, I think uh, that the uh, that the increasing advent of charter schools and historic faith based schools that are finding new ways to enmesh uh, with charters. You know, there, there are places uh, like the Commonwealth of Virginia, if I may say, you know, no school choice, no no charter schools. Why is that? I think we know the answer. Uh, the answer ultimately is is teachers unions. So I think we're, we, we, we have to understand that if we are looking, and I'm not suggesting you are, but if we are looking uh, to kind of hopefully uh, find ways to, to reconnect uh, the great Western tradition and the American experience in most public colleges, universities, or better and elite uh, private uh, institutions, I think uh, we're not going to find it there. But I have to say, uh, because we are conservatives and we are ISI conservatives, we're very confident in, in, in a remnant. We're very confident in this historic view uh, that it doesn't take thousands and thousands and millions. It takes a few uh, people of good cheer and of common will uh, on the greatness of the ancient stories and the and the and and the ancient civilizations. Uh, you know this kind of providential meshing of uh, of Greece and Rome. Um, uh, you know the, the ancient Israelites, the the you know the connection to to Europe and to the United States. I mean th th this is a a remarkable history that comes with philosophy, literature, science, uh, mathematics. Let's let, let's remember that that uh, that that Lincoln himself, right, was a self-taught Euclidean. I mean, th this is this is pretty remarkable, uh, and it goes on and on, doesn't it? So so I have a great sense, and this is the most important thing to say, if I may, gentlemen. I have a great sense that actually our ideas are winning and they are prevailing. We are living right now in the midst of a parental, and I might say, a grand parental rebellion. Uh, of a sudden, people are saying, what is a school board? Can I be on a school board? How do you run for the school board? Uh, tell me what, what a curriculum is. Who is teaching that curriculum? 
how do I connect my own tax dollars to what is taught in the schools? And I could go on and on. And I think it has real ramifications. Uh, I think Dan has written about this so beautifully and so lyrically, how our great ideas actually mesh and connect with the political class. You know, we have we have governors, we have senators, members of the House and Senate, we have state senators and and uh, and uh, members of, of their House of Delegates and House uh, legislatures at the state level, mayors who have said, you know what, I think that this idea of education is much deeper, wider, and broader uh, than than the rather narrow space that it's been in, and it's the kind of ideas that we're talking about today that there is an American story that it's a beautiful story, that it's not a perfect story, that we can be comfortable with teaching about flawed individuals and flawed institutions. But that doesn't make uh, countries, cultures, or civilizations any less objectively exceptional. And we have to be comfortable with that. And I think we have a number of men and women increasingly in the public square who are connecting the great ideas. Uh, the catalyst is always ISI, the great ideas uh, to um, uh, you know, to 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 what it means actually uh, in the halls of power, and I think that that kind of connection between culture, history, um, and good public policy is a very practical way to apply uh, Johnny and Dan to some of the things that we're talking about today. And it's one of the things that I that I seek to do uh, in toward a more perfect union. This is meant to be one tool in the toolbox, uh, but we have to stay engaged uh, and not lose heart. Tim, I think we're about out of time, and that's a perfect note to end it because it's it's optimistic, but not you know uh, naively optimistic. You know, there's 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 some realism there, and we're obviously in this shared project together of that remnant strengthening it and and growing it. And I do think it is expanding as parents, especially, are waking up to what their children are are learning in the classroom. So to wrap things up, if people want to follow your work, if they want to purchase your book. Where can they find you and the work that you're doing at Focus on the Family? Well, Focus on the Family uh, has a very substantial web presence, uh, and people can certainly uh, uh, tap into that today. That would be wonderful. Uh, you know, the, the, the book is widely available everywhere that you buy books. Uh, my, my faithful is my favorite is a place called faithfultext.com. Faithfultext.com uh, because uh, faithful text uh, does not, uh, you know, participate in uh, kind of the political correctness and erasure and all the things that uh, focus on the family and ISI disdain. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it believes in, in good books and does its best to get the word out. And I'm very eager for people to read uh, Toward a More Perfect Union, uh, gentlemen, because, as I say, uh, this conversation really matters. We are at an inflection point in American history, and I think there are millions of people of goodwill uh, who share our concerns and who want to know jo- not just what the problems are, but what we can do about it and and the scope of it. And I think kind of oceans of ideas, better ideas, uh, is the is the way forward. Uh, and I and I hope to contribute in a very uh, small way uh, into that big uh, big conversation. Well, great. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today, Tim. And thank you all for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review. And we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.